Hello, welcome to Topper Machine. I'm Josh Topper, and a while back I asked a question in a community tab post um, of you guys to all ask me questions, anything you want, and you came up with some great questions, so let's get right into it. So when I started the shop in 2012, um, I had no customers, I just, you know, I was kind of fed up with working for others and needed a, a fresh start. Um, I had no customers, and I reached out to an old employer, and they sent me a ton of work, um, which brought in more more work and more you know machines more equipment things progressing um, they eventually went out of business um, but i had picked up several more customers over the years and so it's been a slow progression i've been at this 11 years um, and i've really had to build and struggle and fight to get to where i am um, due to the region i'm in um, there isn't a lot of industry here so things are pretty tough um, so a lot of my work comes from out of out of the area. Um, my closest customer is about 30 miles away, minimum, um, and then it goes out from there. I mean, I can drive an hour or two hours to pick up parts sometimes, so it's it's still a struggle, but uh, we're, we're growing every year, um, improving, adding equipment, so been a been a interesting, interesting um, journey, to say the least. Well, it hasn't been two years yet. Um, we're, we're coming up on two years in February, and I am gonna do a full review of two years of ownership of Lion, but what I can tell you right now is I absolutely love it. Um, my only regret is not buying it sooner. So when I started the shop in 2012, I had this green Monarch lathe here, I had a Bridgeport, and I had the Cincinnati Horizontal, and I had the Warner Swayze number two um, turret lathe. And then from there, I just, added machines as needed. Um, so I kind of started as a hobbyist like a lot of you guys, but I had the the goal in mind was to actually start a full-on business. And that's why machines kept coming in. I kept upgrading, improving, uh, just buying equipment as needed for each job, um, which brought in more jobs. So it was kind of a, a, a progression plan that, that really kind of worked out. But again, it's starting out in this, it was really difficult. Um, this is not an easy business to get into. There's a lot of competition out there. Um, not so much anymore, but um, being in my region, there's, there's really not a lot of work either. So that's, that's tough. So this one, I've, <laughs> I'm on my fourth take now trying to answer this one because this one's a really difficult one to answer. Um, without offending absolutely everybody. A while back, I made a comment in a video how a machine is a consumable. You use a machine up in the production of your parts. Um, I have consumed a few machines over the years and then I've sold them to somebody else who's consuming them further. Um, and th the cycle continues until they eventually get scrapped. Um, I bought uh, and for example, the, the 25N Monarch I sold a couple years ago when I bought the Lion Lathe, I was the fifth owner of that machine. Each owner previous to me consumed that machine in the, in the duties of their job to produce the parts they made. And when it was no longer functional to them, they sold it. I bought it, I produced parts with it until it no longer served the purpose I needed it for. And then I sold it and upgraded. I push these machines to the absolute limits and make the most profit with them as possible and in the process consume them and then know when to replace them. And the difference between a real machinist and a hobbyist is knowing that these machines are being consumed um, and you need to know how to push them to their absolute limits. So I'm not trying to offend you guys, but that's, that's really how it is in business is knowing that difference and using the equipment to their full potential to make as much profit as possible. So welding goes back quite a ways. Um, I think my dad was the first one to teach me stick welding. And then uh, we took some classes in high school, which I did really good in, um, but it was all stick welding in high school. The, um, we, we actually, I came up with the idea of building a sealed box and then fill it with water and try to seal weld it with the stick welder. Um, so that was, a, that was a real challenge and not many, many kids in my class could do it. So that was, that was fun. Um, but I really got good at welding, um, the MIG welding, when I started working for a company that built construction equipment. And we had a welder there named Nate. And 
he was going on vacation and he spent a few days with me and taught me how to do all the welding he did. Um, and it was just, you know, simple production stuff, nothing, nothing major. Um, but he taught me some really valuable skills and tricks that, that I still use today. Um, so that's kind of where it is. And then the TIG welding was in a shop that I was in years ago. Um, the guy who was TIG welding quit and the owner of the shop said, well, I guess you're going to learn how to do it. So I kind of figured it out and I'm not great, but I can do it. And, you know, having been out of it for a few years, I'm getting back into TIG welding and I'm getting much better again, getting practice back. You know, that's some fine stuff there. Save, save as much as possible. Um, you know, I reinvest a lot of the profits back into the business. Um, but I also try to keep a, a, a substantial amount in the checking account to cover these, um, you know, the lean times. So the last few years have been improving greatly as local shops close up, um, owners retiring. Uh, we went from uh, six small one-man shops down to me being the last one. So things have improved greatly there, but it's saving, saving every penny you can. This one's kind of a difficult one. Um, where I live is, is rather depressed as far as industry and um, work that way. Um, a lot of my work is from outside the area, so I spend a lot of time traveling or on the phone. Um, but really, I've never been to the point of where it's cutting into my time. Um, right now, where I'm at is the workload is significant. I'm putting in 12 to 16 hour days. I'm not really doing any marketing other than the YouTube videos, um, which has brought in quite a bit of work um, the last year. And so it's, it's really not been a problem. Um, and then as far as, you know, family time and, and, and freedom time, um, I just make time, um, especially the last few months with losing some very close friends, uh, realizing that I'm coming up, uh, you know, it's quickly coming to the age that they passed and, um, I need to take more time and enjoy life while I'm healthy and young. So uh, being 41, you know, it catches up with you. And I've been having this discussion with a few of my customers and they're all, they're all in agreement that, you know, we all need to enjoy life while we're young and healthy. So it's, it's, it hasn't been a big issue balancing everything. So I started the shop out in 2012. I've been self-employed since then. Um, I have worked side jobs in lean times, um, outside contract jobs, things like that. Um, but in reality, the whole reason I went this route is because I worked for a couple of companies that were run by people with PhDs and no real world knowledge of what they were doing. And you could not convince them to change processes or, or buy equipment to, to better the processes. So going my own way, I could make those decisions. And I've, you know, I have done that over the years is, is up, you know, buy equipment for a specific job that brings in more jobs. And these other companies I've worked for, they couldn't see that in the long run. So that's the whole reason. So I have my own system for bidding jobs. Um, it, it really all depends on the job, really. Um, you know, if it's if it's a boring mill job, it's it's obviously a little, little bit more because it's more time and more setup. If it's a lathe job, it's pretty easy, it's quick. Um, I can knock those out fast. It's, you know, throw it in the chuck and, and do it. Um, but like boring mill, um, intricate, weird stuff, repair jobs, those those all take time. And I, I, I sit and look at the part or the drawing and just figure out a plan. Um, as far as, you know, if it's drilling a hole and tapping a hole, I have a set dollar amount for drilling. I have a set dollar amount for tapping, um, things like that. Um, there's really, it's, it's, it's up to you how you want to do it, but it's, I've kind of got a system that's been working really well. Um, I still feel I might be on the low side compared to a lot of other shops, but um, it's still bringing work in and I'm still making money at it. So that works for me. I've got a few jobs that I do that, that I don't like doing, but yes, they pay very well and I'll do them. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the jobs like that are for customers that really have no choice, nowhere else to go. Um, so a lot of that work comes here. Um, and really I like a challenge. So, 
yeah, I may hate them. I may, you know, hate the work, the job, the, it's, it's time consuming. It's a pain in the butt. It's, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I'm doing this for the customer to help them out. And, you know, at the end of the day, seeing the customer back up and running is, is far more important to me than, than the, you know, the battle I went through to do the job. So it's, it's rewarding in that way. And that's why I continue to do it. And I have turned away customers um, based on a few different things, and I don't want to get into details, but it's, it's you know, if you're in this business, you've got your reasons, I've got my reasons, and, and a lot of times we shouldn't talk about those. So many of you know how much I hate winter, absolutely hate winter, and I have three places I would move. I would move to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, I would move to the Black Hills of South Dakota, or I would go to Alaska. Those are the three places. Um, I just, I like remote, quiet areas <laughs> for some reason. Um, I don't like a lot of people. I don't like the, you know, the hustle and bustle of the city. I don't like any of that. I like being out in nature where it's quiet, peaceful. And, you know, that's where I built my shop is in nature. Um, now I hate winter, absolutely hate it, but all those places have winter also, so I guess, you know, is what it is. But at least I got heat in the shop and I can stay warm all winter and just stay in here and work. So the reason I know that they're, they're, you're having a hard time finding good manual machinists is because they're not teaching it anymore. The high schools aren't teaching it, the tech schools aren't teaching it, um, and the guys that are good are mostly retiring. There aren't many left, uh, there are almost none left that are my age in their early 40s. Um, so a lot of these guys are retiring or, or passing on and, and this, you know, the reality is, is business has all gone CNC. Now, will CNC ever replace manual? No, absolutely not. Um, at least not that I foresee. Um, several of my really big customers are CNC shops, um, either job shops or large manufacturers that are sending stuff to me that's too complicated or complex um, or just they don't have the equipment or capacity to do it. So there'll, there'll always be a need for manual machinists. So the CNC shops are about production. They're about extreme close tolerance and production. Um, they're not about the onesie twosie parts and there's a lot of onesie twosie parts out there. Um, a lot of repair work. Um, you know, you're not just going to go to your local cat dealer and buy, um, say, a pin for your 1940s, you know, dozer or something. They would have to have that made, um, which they probably could in-house, or you just go to a machine shop and have it made. There's a, a, still a huge need for manual machining. Um, you know... I personally don't take on anything with a quantity over 10 pieces and there's no reason for a CNC in that application. The, the low volumes, the weird, the intricate, that's where the, the manual machining comes in. Oh, I've got a lot of projects, a lot of projects. Um, we are going to be building the sawmill shed. I do plan on upgrading a milling machine here, a vertical mill at some point. I'm um, going to be adding a digital readout to the vertical slaughter. Um, there's lots of things in the works. Um, I'm working on my steam engine, which we're going to be um, doing a video on boring the cylinder. And then uh, we may run it over to the hydraulic shop I work with in the Twin Cities and hone it afterwards. So there's lots of really cool stuff um, I'm working on and working into. So a welder is absolutely essential, but you cannot make a lot of the pieces, um, the most important pieces, without a lathe or a milling machine. You really need both to build a proper um, uh, circular sawmill like I did. Um, I used several machines in here and the welder was, was really the key machine um, as far as you know building the main structure, but to build the arbor shaft and the pump, you know, pump supports and things like that, you need the lathe and the milling machine. No, no, I enjoy making the big chips and if, like that big stub shaft video, um, that really only took 45 minutes to take that down to the finished size or close to the finished size, cool it, and then finish it. I had a total of maybe 
maybe an hour into that. I might, might have been less, but I think it was about 45 minutes for that big stub shaft. Yeah, I know I look like a giant next to some of these machines. I'm only 6'2". One thing I would really love to have is a 52 or 54 inch vertical boring mill or turret lathe. Um, one of those would be very handy. I've turned away work that could potentially be done on those and I have projects of my own I could do on one of those. So that would be a great machine to have. So your, your question says you already have a horizontal mill and a um, medium sized lathe. I would definitely get a much bigger lathe um, with a big through hole. That, that is definitely a, a must have um, and a vertical mill. A uh, vertical mill will be a lot easier to set up than your horizontal, even though you may be very proficient with your horizontal, but those are the two things I would consider. So I bought that machine from a company that, so I bought the planer um, from a company that was going out of business and auctioning stuff off and they had a mill head on it. Um, and I've seen a few over the years with a mill head on it. They had done all the retrofit. I just refined it, and when I bought it, there was no mill head on it, so I added a new one. Um, I got a good deal on that Bridgeport J head. I'd love to find a 40 taper head to put on there eventually, but um, I redid the control so it was more user friendly that they had. I put the digital readout on it. Um, it's, it's been a great asset, so it, it was bought that way mostly, um, and then I just refined the, the whole process. But, um, I wish it were still a planer. It could be very handy as a planer, but as it is, it has been a very, very profitable machine for the shop. I was so young, I don't remember it. Um, I was always into something, um, either tearing things apart and putting them back together. or I, There's always been something. I just, I'm so, I, it's been so long, I don't even remember. You'd have to ask my parents if they even remember. So what, what brought on the whole YouTube thing is a friend of mine. Um, he would always bug me to start, you know, I should start a YouTube channel. I should film what I do because it's really interesting. And, and uh, he watches Adam Booth. He watches Keith Fenner. Um, you know, those were his t two big ones. And he said, you know, you do some really cool stuff. You could compete with them or, you know, be on the same level as them. And, and after about three years of him hounding me, um, I finally gave in and thought, okay, let's give this a shot. And, you know, of course, if you look at my early videos, I used some really crappy cameras. Um, I didn't know where this was going. I didn't know what it would bring. So um, I didn't want to invest a lot of money. And now I'm getting into better cameras because of this. Um, it's, it's really taking off. So it's all Randy's fault. It's all his fault. You can blame him. <laughs> As of right now, um, the only plans to expand or for equipment is to replace equipment that I already have. Um, I've been toying with the idea of building a small, small garage next to the shop for tooling, um, a heated and air conditioned tooling building um, that the forklift can live in when it's not here in the shop. Just kind of taking some of the not regularly used stuff and putting it out there um, for just safekeeping out of the way so I'm not tripping on stuff. So I started working on, on rail equipment back in 98, 1998, the summer of 98, I was 16 years old and I was driving 40 miles one way to work for Short Line Tourist Railroad, um, which I still work with today. Um, I was just interested in big equipment and working on the big stuff and um, I've worked with some amazing, amazing mentors over the years. Um, the most recent um, to pass away was Ron Erickson. Um, I dedicated a video to him. He was my electrical and air brake mentor and we worked on some really cool stuff together, um, troubleshooting and, and just some really neat stuff and some great memories and stories there. Um, you know, I've worked with some amazing people and that's what kept me in it um, you know, it's not just the equipment, it was some of the people, um, but it's nowadays things are a lot different. The federal government, the FRA has uh, really made the, the um, industry a, a terrible place to work. And I'm just, I haven't been doing much with it anymore. So I'm just going and helping out the operations when I need to, um, you know, when they, when they have a major problem, I go help them out. 
my stepson has been in a few videos. You've probably seen him walk through the shop or walk in to ask me something, but um, my wife has no desire whatsoever to be on the videos. Um, I've, I filmed one and I got her on it and she was not happy about it. She didn't like the way she looked, all that, you know. It's a camera, you know, it makes you look like crap. I mean, I, honestly, I look way worse in person than I do on film, so um, it kind of all depends on the, the camera, I guess. But uh, no, my family really doesn't want to be on camera. All of them. Um, I work with a lot of plastics, um, steel, a lot of 1018, a lot, a lot of 1045, 4140, 4340, 8620, T1, um, you know, all, I mean, a lot of steels, a lot of, a lot of weird stuff, tool steels. Uh, I see a lot of A2 come through, um, some D2, uh, some O1, not a lot of O1 lately, but uh, the um, mostly, most everything I see is, is 1018 and 1045 on the most common basis. So right now I'm in a busy, busy season. Um, things really picked up. I had, I'm helping out a couple of customers that are in a, in a bind right now. Um, so I have been working weekends. I've been working late nights. Um, having Connor, my apprentice, um, you know, he gets done with school and then he comes and works for three or four hours. So I'm usually out here in the shop by seven, seven thirty in the morning, and he's done at you know seven thirty, eight o'clock at night. So um, I'm out here at least twelve hour days when he's working, if not more. Um, and then on the weekends. Um, I'm out here quite a bit, especially in the winter when there's nothing to do outside. So yeah, I, I do work weekends. So every machine in here, ex with the exception of one, was bought outright. Um, either, you know, it was a, a, a sale, cash sale auction, however, um, all recorded and reported to the IRS properly. Hopefully they're not watching. Um, but everything is documented, everything's tracked. Um, with the exception of the Lion Lathe. The Lion, I do have a loan on. Um, it is a high interest loan, so I'm making double payments on it, but that is the only machine I have ever actually financed. So if you're just getting started out as a, as a machinist going to school or, or whatever, as a hobbyist and you know, who wants to learn, learn everything you possibly can. Um, when you're talking to older guys, older machinists, skilled, knowledgeable guys, shut up and listen. Um, I, I can't, exp you know, argue that one enough. I tell, you know, even when I'm doing the railroad work, when somebody's talking that knows what they're doing or has been in the industry as long as, like, I've been doing it almost 25 years, shut up and listen. You know, I've got guys that I work with that have been, you know, in the industries for 40, 50 years. You shut up and listen, soak it all in, learn everything you possibly can and ask questions. Um, if somebody doesn't want to share what they know, move on, find somebody else. There's lots of people out there that do want to share their, their knowledge and, and see this industry continue. So um, ask questions, learn everything you can. That's the best thing you can do. Well, we had some really great questions. Um, I hope you liked the answers. Um, and keep the questions coming. I'll save them up. We'll do this kind of video again. Um, it's a good way for you guys to learn some, some interesting stuff. Um, I hope I didn't offend a lot of you. Some of these questions are, are hard. Um, and there's hard realities to learn to be in this business. Um, as a shop owner and as a machinist, when I started out just being a machinist, um, I had to learn some really hard, hard lessons. And then when I started out with my own shop, it was just even more. So it's it's very difficult business to be in and uh, some hard, hard life lessons and hard realities to learn. So, but if you have more questions, keep them coming. I will do my best to do another video here as quickly as we got a good quantity of questions. And until next time, get out in your shop and get it done right the first time.